boys, girls, the YouTube world. Today, the Adopt Dog and I are going to see if we can't get this blown small block Chevy running for the first time in five to ten years. So, the story on this thing is I was on the old Facebook Marketplace, like I'm always doing, saw this thing show up, saw the blower sticking through the top, thought it was a pretty good deal. And I've always wanted a small block Chevy with a blower. Ever since about 15 years ago, my cousin and I were at the uh, Outcast Car Show in Mitchell, South Dakota. We were sitting in the parking lot of the hotel having a couple sandwiches, and there was this, this blown coupe sitting there. I think it was a, a Plymouth, some type of Mopar or a GM. Definitely wasn't a Ford, but it sat there and just vroom, vroom, vroom. And anyway, this thing was sitting there idling for like 15 minutes with that blower surge, and we're like, man, he's gonna do something cool. And then he just peeled out all the way across the hotel parking lot. And I looked over at my cousin and I said, I'm gonna own something with a blower someday. And thanks to you, Guys and gals uh, that support the channel, we were able to make that come to fruition just a little bit sooner. We saved all our pennies. We found a pretty good deal on this thing. Like I said, uh, the history is, it's got a lot of history. We'll talk about it as we uh, take a look at it. But anyway, let's cut back to when I drove to this gentleman's place and loaded it up. What did you say the gentleman's name was that built the engine? Ramel Ferguson. Ramel Ferguson, okay. He's actually a really good friend of this guy here, Mike. Okay, cool. They drag raced. They were the fastest black man in the South, and then they drag raced back in the 60s and 70s. Cool. Yeah, there's a lot of history there that. The guy that built it, he was an engineer. Yeah. Yeah, he put, a, he put his three stick on, on a motorcycle. Really? Yeah, he was like the first person ever to put a V8. V8 on a bike? Yeah. Before Holland Davidson, he even thought about it. Yeah. So there's probably old pictures of him all over the internet if you do mm. enough digging. Yeah, I don't know. That was back before there was cameras everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how many guys must have just went to those races and just had a camera, didn't have a car, because like all these pictures that are surfacing old like drag cars and stuff that people... Yeah. Never thought pictures existed. There was always that one guy over in the corner that Doing something. Mm -hmm. taking pictures. Yeah, we just found a guy back home that, man, if there was a, a drag race or a circle track, he was at every one of them, all the cruise nights, and hmm. just all kinds of old guys finding pictures of cars they ain't seen in yeah. 50 years. If I were running a 55 Chevrolet, you run a nine seconds. Really? And then I went to Pro Stock. He used to be one of my sponsors. Yeah. Went 200 something miles an hour in a Beretta, pro stock Beretta. That was a couple days ago then, huh? That was a couple days ago. You don't see many Berettas on the road anymore. No, no. Pro, the guy built them Don Ness, race car. He, that's all he built. He built Shirley Madonna's car, Warren Johnson's car. He did them all. My car. But he's expensive though. <laughs> 40, $40,000 with no. With no motor transmission, he just did the, the chassis. Just for a rolling chassis. A rolling chassis. <laughs> Costs a lot of money to go that fast. Oh yeah. If you want to run ten seconds, gonna cost you ten grand, eleven. We're talking <laughs> about twelve now. So now we got this thing back at the shop. Let's take a look at it. It is a 1941 Chevrolet Coupe. This thing was a street rod in the. 70s 80s and then up to about 1996 when this gentleman got it uh channel put some pictures of the thing in here maybe here down here uh, it had a small block and an automatic and a 55 chevy rear end other than that it was pretty much just a stock 41 chevy coupe from my understanding and looking at the pictures i guess it had some slot wheels and stuff like they did in the 70s and I think in the picture, in the description, it said it was red. Uh, this gentleman that I got it from said when he bought it, it was yellow. So it's been changed a few times over the years. But let's take a look at this thing. So this is kind of how the gentleman I got it was building it. Uh, he put this, or had somebody put this subframe on it. And there's a Art Morrison three-link rear. He was not going to run fenders. Not my jam. So the body's getting sold. That's pretty much already sold. I think the gentleman who bought my 48 Chevy Coupe that we did a video on, we rescued that from an auction sale. He wants to street rod that thing. So I said, hey, I got a deal for you. I got a really nice chassis. I'll set up disc brakes independent. 
all that good stuff, open drive line, everything you need. I just want the engine. So he came and looked at it, said he'll take it. So we're into this thing pretty cheap. But like I said, he was going to put like a 36 Chevy radiator on the front just to keep it cool in a grill shell. And you can see they made this nice aluminum piece to uh, cap off the frame rail. But I don't really like the looks of it. So before we get into the engine, let's look at the rest of the car. This is a Camaro or Nova subframe, 67 to 69 Camaro or like 68 to 74 Nova. They're all similar. Uh, it's got center line wheels on it. These were the cat's pajamas back in the day and some super old Duralon DS premiums. These things are rock hard, super old. I'm guessing they're probably from the late seventies, early eighties. I think they said that these fender well headers were on the previous engine as well. So I don't know. But it's some type of like 2002 BMW or Volkswagen or something purple. Again, not really my jam. Oh, remember the old Heartbeat of America Chevrolet? That was the jam back in the uh, early and mid 90s when I was a kid. It's got ET drag tires on the rear. They're brand new. Looks like it's got superior axle and gear aftermarket axles in the old 12 volt Chevy. I was gonna run an open wheel, no fenders, I guess. I didn't get any of the fenders of the front clip. They left the holes for the trim when they painted it. I think they got it painted and started setting it all together and that was kind of the end of it. Uh, there's a bunch of parts in the car that I haven't even looked at. Hopefully the tail lights and the license plate stuff is there. Why doesn't that stay up though? There we go. She clicked. Like I said, it's got a fuel cell back here. It's all three linked, kind of drag car setup. There's the uh, window garnishings for the front doors. I think these are side panels to go in the back here, but they got to be cut down. They never did finish out the trunk area yet. Yeah, that's about it on the outside. It's a stock body with no fenders painted some god awful purple. They're 28 by 9, 15 tires. I'm sure they're 100 years old. And are probably just for mock-up and rollers. Ooh, they got the screw holes for the bead locks in there. Go fast stuff and the super long wheel studs. I wonder if there's a date on this thing. I'm sure there is somewhere on there. But the old center lines, classic wheel and tire choice, right, Duff? Way better than Craigers. Way better. But before we get into the engine, let's dig out some pieces in the car, see if there's anything we need for the engine, because that's what we're after. Since we got this thing on the old Wildfire lift, the uh, 9000 XLT, so it goes extra high and it's extra long, just the way we like them, huh, Duff? What are you pointing? Anyway, it goes up in the air, so I can walk underneath it without smacking my melon. So this is a rear steer? Camaro or Nova frame, so it's the the earlier ones. It's got disc brakes on it, which is a factory option. You can get them as a uh, aftermarket deal, but I think it's all factory GM stuff, judging by the looks of things, and uh, judging by the date that this thing was built. Even the uh, cross members got a few hooey's like they all do up here in the Midwest. I think they put all new bushings in the control arms, tie rod ends, ball joints, uh, the calipers. All that stuff looks new, so the previous owner stuck some bucks in this thing. He did say this is Ferrari red or something, I don't know, something terrible, but yeah, see, you can tell all the boots are brand new by the way that they are. This is an Aspen. You can tell that it's an Aspen tree because of the way it is. Chrome oil pan, I think these are a giant waste of money. It seems like they always leak. Uh, tin oil pans are kind of prone for that and valve covers, but to pay the extra money to get a chrome one, that A, nobody ever sees, and B, is gonna leak. Seems like a waste of money, but I'm guessing this is all brand new when they built the engine. Chrome dipstick, and those are kind of a, you gotta almost use them anymore because they're the only ones reproduced. It's got an ancient Fram PH13. Whoa, no pull on the jack rack. It'll catch you in the teeth. So I think uh, one of the first things we're gonna do is drain the oil on this thing and uh, put a new filter on it. And we should also unhook the torque converter so that we're not spinning that turbo 400 dry. The nice part about having these fender well headers is we don't have to worry about uh, fit up issues with the steering boxes and all that because it swings out wide. It is a manual steering box, so it's kind of weird combination. 
disc brakes and manual steering. Looks like we got MSD plug wires hanging down here. Our favorite color, red. Looks like a stock ish torque converter. Well, never mind, it's got extra tabs. These are, I don't know, pretty thin. What, 3 16 something like that. And these suckers are like 3 eighths, twice as thick. Turbo 400 pan, you can see that's kind of shaped like a spill. Uh, whereas a Turbo 350 is rectangular with a corner cut off. Looks like somebody bronzed in a uh, drain plug, so that should be handy. Yeah, I guess I'm sure it's got a shift kit and I'm sure it's got a stall in that uh, torque converter, but I guess we'll find out. Brand new flex plate, that's handy. Looks like this is a custom made, what is that, two inch square tubing cross member. Super heavy duty. I don't know that I would have zip tied the fuel line to the power cable on the battery. That's kind of a no-no, I thought. This must be a giant either fuel cooler or filter. I don't know, it seems pretty big to be a filter, so maybe it's a cooler. Got the uh, battery cable. They did a nice job of tying it up and like riveting it to everything. And then they just got lazy over here and just zip tied it to the fuel line. I don't know why they didn't get some more clamps and rivet it. That would have been pretty sweet. It does have a drive shaft in there. That's painted as well. Looks like it was out of a 65 Chevy. They should have ground that off before they painted it. I guess that's what I would have done. There's a couple sins on the floor where they patched it up. Must have had some type of floor shifter at one point in its past life. And then I think this is something custom that they made, but I think this cross member with this dip right here for the drive shaft is all part of this Art Morrison kit. You can see Art Morrison performance and quality. Uh, it's got different, it's got adjustable ends here and then it's got this safety catch in case the end breaks. Uh, there's some adjustments there. There's adjustments here for setting pinion angle. And then, you know, pretty much from here on back is all, I think it's all Art Morrison stuff or it's fabricated stuff, rectangular and square tubing. This is supposed to be a 66 Chevelle 12 bolt with a 373 Posi, he said. Uh, I don't know that we're going to even dig into it and know because we're not going to be using any of this stuff. Uh, coil over shock springs whatever on the rear these are adjustable for ride heights uh, i don't know if you can adjust these for i think you just got to put a different spring in there for if you want to adjust how she rides it's got the holly blue inline pump i'm guessing that's half inch fuel line maybe it's three eighths ginormous anodized fittings there's the fuel cell another chrome cover this one's a differential cover this is uh trailing arm two link suspension then there's a third link across the top that's got adjustability that keeps it adjusts it left and right and then keeps it from wanting to go left and right uh, these got to be some type of aftermarket disc brakes it's missing the calipers but they never had disc brakes on the rear of a 66 chevelle that i'm aware of but yeah everything looks pretty good under here some nice beefy body mounts back there for the tail panel Really nice battery bracket. You can tell they never hooked a battery up to it, never even put an end on that cable. Yeah, they did some, some pretty good work back here. Uh, this must be all bolts for the uh, divider. It's almost like a firewall between the back of the cab and the uh, trunk there. Of course, none of this stuff got tightened when they put it together. It's all just kind of mocked up. Oh yeah, look at this. A little expanding foam in the rockers. Pretty much the entire length. I don't know why people do all this body work and then just don't cut the rust out. I mean, at least cut it out and throw a piece of flat plate in there. Don't put expanding foam. Looks like we're missing a body mount there, but there's a body mount there and over here. And then of course there's rust, not as much expanding foam on that side, but yeah. So everything looks pretty good under there, minus the, the rocker panels. But like I said, I really didn't buy this thing for the body, um, but yeah, don't use expanding foam for body work or for structural support or anything other than sealing the windows in your house. Don't be a hack, that's like DD Speed Shop type stuff. I mean, he would probably, he probably has cars like that. Go check that stuff out on his channel, ddhackshop.ca if you wanna see that stuff. All right, let's get this thing back on the ground. Before we get into this, 
And I rip apart this thing and tear, tear this previous builder apart. This is my car, so I can say whatever I want. I'm not trying to sell it to any of you because I'm keeping the engine. And I already got the body sold, so let's just rip away at the terrible color choices and what other terrible decisions were made in this car's life past. That's all. No door latches. They're tied shut with a ratchet strap, or were. Try not to chip the paint. What's in this door here? Well, that's the regulator for the wing window. Next owner can have that. MSD. The soft touch rev control. No idea what that is, but it must be some type of rev limiter. So we're probably gonna keep that, because that's engine related. I think these are, I don't know anything about MSD 6A boxes or whatever, but these must be our rev increments. I don't know. Odd increments, module kit 3000. We'll keep it. Oh, these are springs for the uh, MSD distributor. Let me guess. MSD wire. I don't know what it's for. We'll keep it. Ooh! Tell me it's red nail polish or purple, you know, for touching up things. Come on! Ugh. Electrical guillotines, scotch clips. Terrible idea. Center line lug nuts. For cheese and rice. Ooh, it's, it's lipstick. It says a lot about the previous owner. He was probably into wearing lipstick. Hey, to each their own. A couple new screwdrivers. This one's a Stanley Duff. Oh, he did say that this engine was run for like 150 miles in a 70 to 72 first gen Monte Carlo. Yeah, allegedly it would pull the wheels and with like 456 gears. And yeah, it was built. 15, 20 years ago, and then uh, ran for that amount of time in that car and never fired. You could tell it was never fired in this car because the fuel system isn't completed. Radmiator cap, dome light cover. Looks like more Monte Carlo signage. I think that's an alternator, pivot bolt. A couple things we'll save in there. Not saving the lipstick. Who's this? Sonic Racing Products. I know who Sonic the Hedgehog is. Mm. And I know the restaurant, but I don't know anything about their racing product. The Menards bag. If you're not from the Midwest, you don't know what Menards is, go check them out. They're kind of like a Home Depot or Lowe's, but they have the best plastic bags. They're like three times thicker than everybody else's. Save big money. A TG30 oil filter. The old tough guard with the gripper on it. Some fresh R44 TS Delco plugs. Those are keepers. And if this thing doesn't run, this is why. Flexi hoses. Top and bottom. Oh, look at that. This one's blowed out. So we can just throw that right in the garbage. Duff, go get the garbage. If you don't want to watch me take all the stuff out of the car, just go ahead and skip ahead to when we start wrenching and working. But I got to dig through this to see what kind of goodies we got to get me excited and uh, to find the things that we probably need to get the car running. Main thing is the MSD box, because I didn't see that on the firewall, so we're going to need that. Pulley? Is that for a short water pump or long duff? Yeah, I don't know either. I think it's for long. More lug nuts. These ones got the big long shank on them. I'm guessing that's what these center lines use, you know? Race car things. Thread it all the way through. Chrome. Looks like that's a knob for something. Oh yeah, you can see it's been to some car shows. Main Motors in Anoka, 24th National, 1994. We'll have to look that up, see what that was all about. Torque converter bolts, Unilug washers, all the good stuff. She's ripe in there. Rear view mirror, tail lights, what do they say for a year? 1970, so I'm guessing they're from a 70 Monte Carlo. There's the stock ones for this car. Wiper arms and wiper blades. Plug for your boat. Another ratchet strap. I don't know what these lights are for. They're not for this car, but they're glass. They're kind of cool. What do we got here? We got some new parts. It's like a float or something. Oh, it says John Deere on it. Must be for a John Deere mower. We're just going to throw that away. Let's see. Miscellaneous screws and hardware, body bolts, window cranks, 
Yeah, that's all stuff that can go to the gentleman who bought the body. I think that's the hood trim, even though it doesn't have a hood anymore. Or grill trim, spear. All purpose contact adhesive. It's probably 30 years old. Here for the transmission mount. No, it seems a little wide. I don't know that I've ever had a 41 Chevy, so a lot of this stuff is foreign to me. When I was growing up, my uncle, well, I still got it, 41 Chevy, 40 Chevy convertible, same thing, only difference between a 40 and a 41. I think there's a, it's just that the headlights, the running boards exist on a 40, and then 41, they're gone, they're hidden, they're inside the door, and the headlights, are on the fenders on a 40 and they're in the fenders on a 41. Your worthless information. All right, back at it. Somebody fabricate, oh, must have been a recessed license plate bracket, French license plate. Window seals, center caps, hood springs. Oh. Dual carb fuel block, better save that. Trunk latch. I don't know what this miscellaneous stuff is. Engine mounts, body mounts, wing windows, window regulators, side glass, window trim and stainless. These seats, he said, are out of like a 63 to 65 Riviera, which we've had a couple of those cars. And I've had several sets of these seats, so they can stay with the car. They're black. And they're in pretty good shape. They need recovered. Let's go see what's on the other side of the car. Door needs a little adjustment. She's a little tight up there. Roll control, stainless steel rebuildable valve made in the USA. The original line lock slash hill holder. I've never had a car with a line lock, so we're gonna need that. Door handles, oh, the infamous Jesus clip tool for getting door handles off. Window seals. Door seals, more seals, brake line, we can use that, 3 16 for our line lock. A whole box of header bolts, score, because I love headers, partially because you have to have special bolts to put headers on, but could they just make them use regular bolts like the manifolds? Tail light housings, all kinds of tail light housings, more door seals. Another mirror. They must have taken a couple cars apart. This, where does this go? Where do, how do I recognize this? It goes on the wing window or something? I think it goes on the outside over the wing window. I can't remember. They're like smoking so that the air doesn't go away. Oh, look at this cute little steering coupler they made. This is a cute little guy. He just a little guy. Rag joint going on the steering box and it hooks to the bottom of the column. Coil or a tack bracket or a boost gauge, another one. Well, dang damn it, where's that MSD box at? More wipers, more door seals. Ooh, Wes's favorite battery cable clamp on ends. OJ's glove. Never mind, it fits, it's the wrong one. I guess they had a booster and master cylinder mounted to the firewall. Originally, when he got the car, when it was street routed the first time, but it wouldn't clear the blower. So that was one of his hangups. He needed to uh, refabricate that, apparently. Another battery cable end. Score. Ah, the spacer was for the steering column spacer, the drop down bracket. Looks like it's got an aftermarket cab harness in it, too. So this thing was pretty well set up at one point, or going to be. Sorry, OJ. Yeah. Kick panel, there's the windows. It does have door panels and headliner in it. Well, the rear door panels. That's a really nice headliner, actually. But no door panels for these doors. I think there's only one door glass and only one wing window, so it's misses pieces. It's got a pretty nice dash in it. Got some aftermarket Stuart Horner gauges over there. My favorite later GM tilt column. Oh, it's a telescopic even. What a deal. And then the sweet boost gauge. Anything in the glove box? Nope. Yeah, there's the cobbled up wire harness. 
It's got that later model GM pedal for the firewall install. The factory super deluxe heater. Yeah, it's got carpet in it. Looks like they made some like, oh, they're wood. Like six by six risers covered in carpet for the seats. I think he said it had a bench seat, just a stock bench seat that was recovered when he got it. There's a bunch of trim behind the seats back here. So yeah, pretty much all the stuff to put the car together. Boy, I hope that wasn't the god awful. Well, that's green, not yellow that this car was. They did a nice job of painting it if it was red, green, whatever, all these different colors. They actually painted the jams out. A lot of times people will forget to do that or not uh, do it. Ooh, washer for the uh, wheels as well. Bug nuts. God dang it, these heavy guys. Got to have them. Well, shoot, found a few goodies in there. I was hoping I'd find an MSD 6AL or whatever 6A controller because that's what he said this thing needs. But. Well, now let's get to the meat and potatoes of this video. This blown small block Chevy. And by blown, it does not mean it's blown up. It means it's got a supercharger on it. Forced air induction. Boosted, non-naturally aspirated. All of the goodness. So this thing is a small block Chevy. 350, I suppose it started its life off. It's got cast iron stock GM heads. They're probably reworked, I'm guessing. I believe it's got roller rockers in it. It's got a blower shop 671. It's got a pair of Holly four barrels on it. It's got an MSD ignition. It's got Tri-5 Chevy fender well headers. Yeah, yeah, right there. It means we got to build a 55 Chevy two-door post with a straight axle and a clutch pedal because that's what I want to put this thing in eventually. And I just happen to have a car back here and a Ford 9-inch and some spare frames and maybe some uh, Muncie's upstairs. But that's for another topic. We gotta get this engine running first. I was looking at that MSD, that soft touch rev control box. It looks like it was dated uh, April 27th of 2007. So I'm guessing that's when they bought it. So let's just say 15-ish years ago, 2007, 2024, 20, 17-ish years ago. So let's just say 15 years ago, they put this thing together. They ran it for a little bit. He said they had it running like five or six years ago. Uh, the gentleman's name, Rommel Ferguson, or Romel Ferguson. Uh, looks like he passed away in like 2008, but he's a gentleman from the cities. That's where this car came from, the Minneapolis area. Sounds like he was a big drag racer. And these guys that I got this thing from, the guy that was storing it and the guy that owned it, were uh, pretty good buddies with him. And it sounds like they were a force to be reckoned with back in the day. So let's take a look at this thing a little bit closer. Like I said, small block Chevy. Um, are also tall valve covers, which kind of leads me to believe it does have the roller rockers in it. It's got this little tiny, I believe it's a foreign jobby, you know, a Honda or Toyota or somebody alternator, which is a lot of tr people would do just to get a smaller alternator in there. It's got this 3 8 chain, keep it from tearing loose. It's got an aluminum plate, so she's mounted solid. But this is a pretty cute alternator bracket. Uh, here's our giant gates belt running this blower. So thing with blowers is the crankshaft turns a couple of turbines in there which compresses the air and the fuel stuffs it into the engine so you don't need a high compression engine to make gobs and gobs of horsepower. It's got some fancy chrome water pump. It's got a fancy timing indicator which I'm guessing this stuff's all done up right. It's got the little, well when you build an engine you put this little tab on there to tell if it's ever been overheated. It doesn't look like it's been overheated. It's so clean you could tell that yeah it doesn't have many miles on it. It's got all the fancy 12 bolt ARP fasteners, billet aluminum water pump. We're gonna have to run an electric fan, unfortunately. I know, and an electric fuel pump though, because the mechanical one just probably ain't gonna keep up. Like I said, uh, TBS, the Superstation, also known as the blower shop, is who uh, put this thing together or offers this kit. They're still in business, it looks like. This week's Mortsky Minute is brought to you by Casa de la Catalina version 1962 with a four speed option and such. Anyway, this week's discussion on the Mortsky Minute is the blower shop. TBS, no, not Tobacco Slough, not the Superstation, not the Turner Broadcasting Services, but the blower shop. The blower shop is based out of Boise, Idaho, was started in 1984 by Ron Hayes Sr. Ron Hayes Jr. now runs the company. Uh, like I said, they're run out of Boise, Idaho. Everything is made in-house. There's about 20 to 25 employees. Uh, they do everything top to bottom in-house. 
Uh, they don't take orders on the internet. You got to call them up. That's how uh, old fashioned they are. And they actually were created in 1984 when they bought out Bowers Blowers. So we'll have to do maybe a more scheme on Bowers Blowers. I couldn't find a whole lot about Bowers Blowers, but we'll have to look them up because it just rolls off the tongue so great. Bowers Blowers. But anyway, they started as uh, supporting drag racing enthusiasts, uh, top fuel, alcohol racers, uh, boat racers, stuff like that. And that has evolved into the automotive enthusiasts such as myself here. Uh, they have mainly do uh, work around the root style blower like what we have, the 671, so the 71 series, but they have other series available. They offer replacement parts. You can buy different pulleys. You can buy new gaskets. They offer rebuild services, I would imagine, just throwing that out there. But Anyway, I talked to Eric. He'd been with him for 21 years. Uh, super nice guy. Gave me some information about uh, Mr. Hayes. And so, yeah, that's today's Mordsky Minute brought to you by Hotel Poncho. Now back to your regularly scheduled shenanigans. It's got the old bug catcher up here. It's got some pretty neat throttle bracketry and linkage and everything going on here because the carburetor's okay. Maybe it's not that cool. All right, we'll just uh, set that back down there. Pretend like that didn't happen. The uh, carburetors have to sit sideways so that they got clearance for the fuel lines and all that stuff. It's got a fuel pressure gauge up here, fuel pressure regulator here. It looks like they made some nice brackets to mount all that stuff. I was admiring the brackets that they got over here. Oh, they're double pumpers, dual feed lines, one on each side. Then they tee off of these uh, volt or pressure regulators too so you can check each side uh we're gonna have to open up those carburetors i want to see make sure there's no ethanol in there we'll take the top off the blower we'll take the belt off and we'll make sure that there's nothing in the blower we'll pull the distributor mark it and prime the oil pump pull the valve cover see what's going on in there and when we're priming it we'll see we've got oil pressure in the gauge inside the car it looks like it's hooked up and we'll make sure we got oil pressure up top here uh, before we do that we're going to drain the oil put different oil in it just do a once over probably pull the spark plugs out maybe throw some oil in the cylinders maybe maybe don't get your hopes up and maybe stick the old depth deck down the uh cylinder hole make sure there's nothing crazy going on over there just a lot of stuff that i want to make sure we don't ruin this engine it's been sitting a while it was not in a heated building it was in a building but it wasn't climate controlled so there might have been some humidity that got in there but we just want to make sure we do our due diligence so that we don't ruin anything because I thought I got a pretty good deal on this car. I know I got a good deal on this car, but if I ruin this engine, then I paid way too much for everything you see here. So it sounds like it's pretty standard bottom end on these things. I don't know. I don't know much about blower engines. I only know one guy, Randy Gribble. It's got a car with a supercharger on it. Uh, DD Speed Shop's got a little toy, little baby 471. And uh, B and C performance, uh, he drives daily drives a '57 Chevy Gasser down in Hawaii, and he's got like 15, 20 thousand miles on it. Think, so he knows a few things too, but those guys just know about driving them and maybe setting them up, but not anything about one that's been sitting for a while and how to get it back on the road. So that is something that we're going to have to uh, learn our own. But we're just going to take our time. I don't want to get too deep into it, I don't want to have to retorque head gaskets and retorque rod caps stuff because it should have been all done up right by Rommel. But yeah, we gotta do a little digging. The other thing, it's got this MSD Pro Billet distributor, it's a part number 8555 1. And I think it needs that MSD 6A box to run. So the 6A is a uh, MSD's ignition module control box. The 6AL has a rev limiter built in it, which this must have just had a 6A, which I cannot find. And that we had that soft touch rev control that was built in 2007, and that would have made the L part of the 6AL. So we're gonna have to do a little digging and see what we need here. There's a two pin connector coming out of the uh, distributor, and then there's just a regular coil on the firewall. So I gotta do a little research. I know nothing about the MSD 6ALs. I just know they're super common. Everybody uses them, so they must be good. We're gonna have to get one of those coming before we can fire it up, but we can do some other things in the meanwhile. So I'm gonna do a little research on the old 6A and get one of those coming. Uh, it's gonna be Martin Luther King Day this week, so that's gonna screw into the shipping schedule. So 
it might be pushed out. This this video is already like a month out from when we got the car here because we had other stuff to do. And yeah, I just gotta get ripping into it. I'm excited about this thing, but also we're not gonna get to drive it because I'm not gonna drive this car because it's it's terrible and I don't want to put a cooling system and wire it up and yada yada yada. We're just gonna make it. We're just gonna use it as a run stand for now. And this engine's probably not gonna get driven in the winter, so we're just gonna get it running and then stuff it away in something comment down below what you want to see us put this thing in uh, we talked about putting in dirt rentals that'd be pretty sweet but that's already got an ls that works uh reggie would be pretty sweet but then we'd have to cut the hood i don't know i want some like ratty nasty like 74 chevy impala or caprice just a big old boat that just to romp on this thing and all my buddies can ride around in it and just annihilate some uh 225 70 15 tires at will allegedly this thing's like 650 horse that's what he's telling us he also said that it would pull the wheels from a dig but i don't know if i believe that can't believe everything you hear right Duff? especially if it's on the internet it's all lies he also said the 6a box was in the car somewhere and clearly it's not all right let's do some research on the unit webs all right we're back on the blower motor I ordered an MSD 6A box. I got the MSD black because I think red is obnoxious. And this is the 6A L, so it's got the rev limiter built into it. Part number 6425 if you need one. It quickens throttle response and improves starting and increases overall performance and power. It's a high output multiple spark ignition control. First time we've really messed with one, ain't it, Duff? Anyway, first thing I think we're gonna do here is we're going to get that blower belt off and we're going to take the carburetors off and we're going to look at those things make sure they're not all gummed up with ethanol and whatnot and then we're going to take that top hat off and look inside the blower and see if everything is kosher in there maybe spinning around because everything's a super tight tolerance in there and we don't want trash getting the blades of that blower and screwing it all up because then it's just going to be a really expensive cool looking paperweight Let's do that. Let's get the belt off first stuff. To do that, I think we just take this bolt loose and this tensioner, it's got that slot you can see back there. Just slide it over, take the belt off, and then we'll pop some throttle linkage off. I think I was playing with this the other day and I think it's just barely held on. Maybe I lied. Oh, it's down here. Anywho, we'll get the bug scoop off, fuel lines, the rest of the linkage, return springs, all that good stuff and take a peek inside. Maybe there'll be something good in there, Duff. Hopefully nothing bad. All right, let's go. Doesn't look like we need a wrench to hold the back side. Don't snap. Anytime you've got a steel bolt going into aluminum, you're gonna wanna put anti-seize on it. All right. Guessing this pulley's smaller, maybe it'll slide off that easier. Who knows? Seen some rat rods and hot rods and stuff where guys will pinstripe on there. Some pretty cool stuff. This is a Gates Power Grip, part number 1440 8GMT. Because I'm sure that you definitely need that same blower pulley set up on your hot rod. Now, how do I take this ugly? bird scoop off. I take all them bolts off from the inside. That's gonna suck. Looks like there's a whole bunch of tiny little screws down here. Can we get them with a ratchet? Oh, no. Maybe. How many of these suckers we got? Eight of them? Four on each side? Ugh. Watch me work real fast taking these things out. So if you've never messed with one of these bug catchers before, this is all cast polished aluminum. And there's all these bolts around the perimeter that hold that base plate. And on that sandwiched down by just standard air cleaners. Then you got this linkage here that Opens your butterflies. These butterflies don't do anything. They're really just for looks. They kind of, they probably keep birds out of there. Maybe some very large bugs, some dragonflies and such. 
And then up here you got these plates with these huge adjustments in there so that that way you can, you know, basically any carb setup, you can uh, bolt that thing on. So now we just gotta take these guys off. And uh, yeah, start unhooking some linkage and whatnot. Since these fuel fittings are anodized aluminum, we're gonna use a anodized aluminum Swedish nut lathe. This one's made by Earl's from 7075 aircraft aluminum. And uh, hopefully that doesn't scar them up. I'm gonna this throttle return spring while we're over here. This is some complicated stuff. Usually your carburetors sit this way and then you just got your wapa wapa. And all the carburetors sit this way so you get your wapa wapa. So you gotta have things. Anyway, the biggest concern is getting it back together the right way. So thank goodness for GoPros and recording all this so I can try to figure out how to put it back together even though I don't know how to run the GoPro to rewatch the video. Chin won't ever show me. He's too busy doing quadra jet things. So it looks like I need an Allen wrench to unhook the linkages, and then we can take a half inch wrench and these mounting bolts, hold this whole shaft and all that assembly. So I'm gonna go get some tools. <laughs> Alright, I think we got all the linkage unhooked. This stuff's pretty great. It's like infinitely adjustable. You can adjust spacing, you can adjust the way that it's clocked. Pretty neat stuff. I assume it came from blower shop, but way better than trying to make something on your own. For me anyway. Alright, let's get some mounting bolts out. Interesting. Most of these carb bolts were finger tight, maybe a little bit more. So I don't know if the gaskets just collapsed over the years or something worse. This thing was all just set together for no reason. The seller told me it was a running engine. Maybe they set it in place and had the carburetors off and they just set them on there and then they were tightened them up before they fired it up again. Could be. All right, let's get these guys off of there. Well, they're on there getting stuck to the gaskets there. I'm not sure that it makes a difference, but I labeled these carburetors front and rear. A little R there and a little left there. What better way to do it, right Duff? All right, and this here is the blower, the top hat, I think they call it. So, we're going to take the gaskets off, and I think there's some Allens, yep. Six Allen bolts in there. Looks like they're drilled dual patterns, so you can put a square bore and a spread bore. And we got this cute little bug screen in there. Let's take that off, and then we're going to make sure there's no crap in our blowers. We should be able to use these gaskets again. They look like they're pretty good shape. Hopefully this gasket's in good shape. These are just regular carb gaskets, but I don't have any blower top hat gaskets around. All right, let's hope this gasket doesn't tear. Apparently that screen is part of the gasket. Well, it looks like something got in there at one point. There's a little scuff mark right there. Probably minor, but it shouldn't be stuff in there. We'll see if we can't clean it up a bit. I don't know how to describe these other than they're a really well machined surface. It's almost a they're super tight tolerance and as they spin, they compress air and cram it into the engine. So you don't want any dirt in there because that's going to have to get compressed. And you can see a couple scuffs in there. That one looks like it's been there a while. All right, 
I'm going to clean some stuff out of here. That's disappointing. The joys of buying mystery engines from mystery people. Man, there's a big one right there. I don't know how that's going to affect this thing. I'm sure it's not going to be as efficient or make as much boost because stuff's going to leak by there, but somebody uh, definitely didn't uh, take very good care of. Being sure they had everything clean when they put this together. Let's get that out of there. Hopefully it's not too late. All right, we got our cleanup as good as we can. There's a couple of little scars in there. That one's been there a while. But you can see those ones are pretty fresh. And like I said, it's just a really tight tolerance in there. That one's older, so I'm not too worried about it. It is what it is. It's just not gonna create as much boost because there's gonna be air leaking behind those things. So it's not gonna be as efficient probably, but <clears throat> we'll just have to put a smaller party pulley on there. All right, let's uh, open the bowls on those carburetors. See what it looks like inside of them. But in the meanwhile, let's put a nice clean fender cover over the top of that. Get yours at Mortsky.com to try to keep any more crap from going in there. Tech tip of the day, don't get crap in your blow. Make sure this backside of our nice new fender cover, we don't have too much debris in it. Slide that over. There. That'll keep the big stuff from coming in there. All we're going to do here on these hollies, take these four screws out on each end, remove the bowl, look in there and make sure it's better looking shape than the inside of the blower. Main thing is corrosion and I guess rust, but hopefully we don't see any rust in there. That would be Real bad. Mainly corrosion from ethanol, and then because this is aluminum. I don't know if there's much in there that can rust. Hopefully the gaskets are reusable because I don't have any spare or any holly gaskets around. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's probably some in the back somewhere. Not looking good for the home team. Well, there is a little bit of rust in there. Nothing crazy. But otherwise, it looks pretty clean. I think we're just gonna button that back up. I'm sure it's gonna leak because it seems like every holly carb that I've ever <laughs> dealt with does. All right, I'm gonna wipe that out. We'll do the same thing, tear them all apart. Probably put a new vacuum plug on and go from there. Looks like they got silicone on the top of the air cleaner lid, so they really wanted her sealed tight. And I noticed something else. Each one of these things has the lid of a Delco spark plug box glued up in place. Must be right there. There must be a hole there they wanted sealed up. Yeah. So I wonder what that's for. Hmm. I was going to pry it off there, but I thought, let's look at the other one. They both got it. So we're just, we're just going to leave that. Seems kind of like some hackery, but I'm sure it's just there temporary while this, whatever it is that they put in there set up. Seems like a GB Weld type epoxy. She's pretty solid, so I think we could take it off there, but we're just, we're just going to leave it. There should be a list number on these things. There it is, right there. 4777-7 and 2386. We'll have to look them up.
We keep on keeping on though, keeping up with the fuel system. I didn't hook the fuel lines up. I think we're gonna take some compressed air, maybe hook it off, unhook it, unhook it at the tank. And a couple other spots, because with this T here, it's gonna take the path of least resistance. And then there's another T up here. Good news is there's two of these awesome glass filters that nobody cares for. So, let's unhook some stuff. And throw some compressed air at it, eh? Yeah, good idea. Because we don't want any more crap in our carburetors. They did look pretty clean. There was a couple specks of rust, but that's about it. Looks pretty good, huh? Run it, he says. Will do. All right, add this to things I hate. Braided fuel line, this stuff gets really stiff. It won't come unhooked. It's a pain to hook up. It cuts your fingers, it's a pain to cut. And I just don't like the way that it looks, especially when you put blue and red or purple or whatever anodized ends on it. Rant over. It's probably not even better in a lot of applications. I don't know, hydraulic hose, I get it, needs to be braided to hold pressure, but something that's gonna hold 15, 20 pounds of fuel, especially in a low pressure system like this, I don't get it. Continuing on, how are we gonna do this? It's all braided on a barb fitting down here. So without already cutting a finger, I don't have a good idea on what to do. Maybe I can still thread that fitting. Jeepers, why is that so tight? <laughs> Ah, about that. Let's see what we got at the back end on here. I'm an idiot, lifted this car up for no reason. Looks like we'll unhook it right at that Holly blue fuel pump. Forgot that there's no trunk floor. All right, back down. Well, that's convenient, it's not even tight. Nor is the pump, or the fittings into the pump. I think we're going to be finding a lot of this half-finished stuff. All right, now if we blow back there, should blow through all these, and vice versa. Yeah. I don't know which way we want to, probably want to push it that way, then the filters will catch it. I don't know. I don't think it matters, as long as we get it blown out. All right, I think we're going to pull the spark plugs out, and then we'll... Stick our dipstick, depth stick, probe in the cylinders, make sure everything looks good. I see something, I'll let you know, otherwise we're just gonna prod around in there and then we'll squirt a little croil in the cylinders and continue moving on. I sure hope there's nothing inside the cylinders because that would be devastating. I'm sure these spark plugs are gonna be a real treat to take out. Oh, they're all below the headers, they might be okay. Do we need to mark all those? Somebody already marked them? Yep. You got the handy dandy label makers right on the wire. What a deal. Crazy. What a deal. Looks like we got some Delco plugs. Probably the same plugs that they use the cardboard from to patch up our carburetor. If I were to guess. They got a little soot on them. They've been run. R44 TS's. Nothing wrong with that, I don't think. That's going to be an issue. That one is tapped shut. Wonder what led to that. Oh boy. Did I just buy myself a really shiny boat anchor? Eight looks good. Six looks fine as well. Ooh, we get a deal with steering on this side. Yay. One looks good. Five and seven look fine as well. We're gonna have to use a wrench to get number three out. Three looks fine as well. Bad news, kids. I see why the gap is closed on the spark plug. 
You see that? That is the top piston ring. Right there. Choke a piston came off. I got screwed. I bought this thing for the engine. Should have done my homework. I should have brought, I could have brought wrenches and I could have brought the depth stick and a test long here and probe around inside this engine and prevented this. The good news is I don't see any other damage in there. We'll tear this thing down and get some new pistons or at least one new piston and see what it's going to take to fix it. This sucks. This absolutely sucks. But this is the gamble you take buying expensive engines that are used. Even new engines don't last sometimes very long, but it's pretty early today. I might go crack a sandwich, drown my sorrows. Yeah. There is a big old chunk of piston missing, and you can see where stuff's been rattling around in there, obviously. I'm not sure what those pistons are. They got a dish to them. Hopefully we can find a replacement. Or maybe those pistons weren't meant for boost. Yeah, this guy screwed me. Oh, there's a nick in the cylinder wall. God damn it. I usually don't say damn it very often, but this is a real damn it moment. That sucks. That really sucks. Well, the good news is we learned a lesson, a very, very expensive lesson. And uh, good news also is we get to learn about blower engines because we're going to be tearing this thing apart. Do I think whatever was in the blower caused that? No, but either way, keep crap out of your blower and uh, don't sell crappy engines to unsuspecting individuals because karma comes around. All right, I'm gonna look through the rest of them. I'm sure they're gonna be fine, but of course it had to be the first one I looked in, but I should have known looking at the spark plug. Like how did that spark plug gap get closed? Ugh, I'm sure the valves are going to be tore up, but I'm sure it's going to need a sleeve or board out or something. Yeah. Anybody want to buy a blower engine? I'm willing to lose money on it. Great. Grand. Wonderful. Good. Great. Grand. Wonderful. Take a look in that cylinder number two. Uh-oh. Or here, you you just watch the screen. You probably don't know how to run this technology. Yeah, I don't. Here, hang on to that so it stays out of the way of the screen. You can still hang on to your Mountain Dew. Okay. See anything yet? What's that? Yeah. What do you think that is? <laughs> Valve. That's the top of the piston. Yeah, and that's really and that's the ring hanging out there. Paisley, what are you doing? Come here. Come here. Don't be shy. Come come say hi to Mojo. He'll give you some cookies. Come here. Come look at this. You tell us what you think of this piston. Say, Morsky, quit buying dumb stuff for big money on the uh, marketplace. Internet. Screwed you again. Yeah. Dang it. Thought Abe Legan couldn't tell why. Go look at, go look at the screen. Your dad's going to probably have to pick you up. We got the wildfire lift up in the air. Duff's licking you to death. Look at that, look at that cute little TV down there. Yeah. Yeah. Is that no bueno? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Show them where that uh, piston ring is hanging out the top gland of that piston. And the, and the rest of it is missing. You got a lot of pink on today. Pink boots, yeah. pink gloves, uh -huh. pink jacket. Uh -huh. You need a pink cap. Cap? Cap. Ball cap, stocking cap, keep your ears warm, not a kitty cat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. Well, all right, slept on it. We got to tear this thing apart either way to know what we're going to do. But I got a couple ideas in mind. But we got to get this thing apart. So let's tear apart our first blower motor. Yeah, it should be pretty exciting. I'm a little disappointed that uh, I 
spent a whole bunch of money on this. My, what I thought was going to be my prized possession in my engine collection. And uh, it just needs a little bit more money thrown at it. That's all. That's all it is. Just more money and time. Money and time. Money equals time. There's an equation for that. But, and then money is the root of all evil. I don't know. Anywho, let's get ripping into this thing. I think the first thing we're going to do is take the blower setup off. So we'll probably, no point in marking the distributor because this thing's not going to go back together. Just drop back together. It's going to have to get some machine work, I would assume. But anyway, let's get the blower off, headers off, intake, distributor, valve covers, heads, all that good stuff. And then we'll just pull the block and transmission out after that. Alrighty. Glad we put those carburetors back on there so we can take, we don't even have to take them off probably. We can just leave them with the blower. That's gonna be heavy. We're not gonna wanna drop it. Perfect. All right, let's do this. Well, that's gonna be a problem. I don't know if I can get the distributor cap. Oh, it might go out through here. We might get her. So I don't know if the distributor is gonna come out. I'm guessing this thing was all set together when they set it in place. Clearly. Oh, that is tight. Tight like a tiger. Yes, you are tight like a tiger. Nothing too crazy in there. It's definitely been run. Made in USA, that's good. MSD ignition. So, yeah, here's those nice cute little labels for the cylinders. So they did that for us at least. All right, let's keep ripping parts off. And this is all for the distributor. I think we just got one. Ugh. This must be for the boost gauge. Should just be one bolt back there holding the distributor down. Oh, it's got the blower manifold's got a bolt. You can either clamp it from the passenger side or the driver's side. So, of course, it's on the other side. But never seen an intake like that where it's got a bolt to hold the distributor down on either side. But uh, blower things, you don't got a lot of real estate. So, must be why they did it. Yeah, there's also a vacuum hose back here. It looks like it goes down to our turbo 400, but it also looks like it's hooked up to the boost gauge. So that's weird. Usually you want vacuum for your vacuum modulator. And there's going to be, I assume, boost pressure here. So it's going to be pressure instead of vacuum. The black line goes down, I assume, to the transmission. And this clear line goes inside the cab to the boost gauge. Interesting. Maybe vacuum modulators don't care if they get boost versus vacuum. I would think you'd have to get a vacuum line hooked up to one of these distributors. What do I know? Nothing about boost, clearly. We're buying used engines. Imagine that. Oil pressure line fitting was loose. Temp center fitting finger tight. Let's see if we can fish this MSD distributor out here. Oh boy, it's close. Well, I guess we can leave it for now. We gotta split the blower from the manifold because you can't get at the manifold bolts until the blower is off. And once the blower is off, then we'll be able to get that distributor on there. So now we got all these three ace bolts going around the edge, it looks like. Could use the big bolts to hold all that pressure down. Since we're probably gonna be doing something different where we Got time to order a gasket, but I'm, I'm not gonna have a blower to a uh, manifold gasket on hand. I'm guessing the manifold gaskets are just your standard small block Chevy gaskets, but this gasket not so much. So hopefully it's in good shape. Go fast stuff, aluminum nuts. Made a nice little bed for our blower over here. Let's see if we can't get it. Frame rail bumper thing on it. Is it held on by anything? Just friction. 
Well, I just was at the chiropractor yesterday, so should be good. Okay, it's loose. This is probably a two-person job, eh? Oh, you balance there. Well, I get that. No, it's not light. <laughs> oh. Woo. Good news is it wasn't stuck. And our gasket didn't come with it. Or tear, I should say. So, let's see if we can carefully remove this gasket so that we could do a blower on a budget on another motor. Budget blower build. You think anybody's done one of those? Blown budget. Yeah, that's what it should be called. Oh, that's pretty neat. It uses just the regular small block Chevy thermostat housing. Just bolt it on 90 degrees off. Let's use our screwed by Mortsky repair screwdriver here. Get yours at Mortsky.com. See if we can't salvage this gasket. I can tell you this, my local parts store is not going to have a blower gasket on hand and they probably can't even order me one. Check into it Napa Todd, so you can get us a blower gasket. We did a pretty good job. Interface solutions. Like I said, I've never done this before, but sure enough, the bolts are inside of the manifold. Because where else are you going to bolt them? They are nice 12 bolt ARP bolts. They went all out on the hardware. And that means I'm going to have to go get some 12 point sockets because, I mean, I have some, but I never use them. I always use the six points. I'm going to go dig through those, get the old 12 point craftsman's out that I've had since I was like 12 years old. That was only three or four years ago. Oh, hey, we can take the distributor out now, though. Got it. What size are these things going to be? 7 16 3 eighths. Probably a size that I don't freaking have. 3 eighths. All right, I got them all. Oh, tight fit. That's what she said. <laughs> These things are at such an extreme angle that I can't get a socket on them very good. How the heck did they get these in there and torqued? We need some low profile 12 point quarter inch drive socket or what? I guess I gotta get a set of blower motor tools. Well, the washers are magnetic, but the bolts aren't, so they must be stainless steel bolts. They're too heavy to be aluminum. Can't quite get a socket on this front one, so we're using the old 12 point box end wrench. Even that don't fit so well. She's a tight fit. All right, any bets if they use China wall gaskets or if they use uh, silicone? Hope they use silicone. Here goes nothing. Oh my. Two, four, six. Two, four, six. Must be silicone and dang good stuff at that. Wowza! Oh, it's hitting on the valve covers. Let's take these stupid wingnut bolts and get that out of the way. Another pet peeve of mine. T-handle valve cover bolts. Yuck. They go great with headers and craggers and side pipes. And yellow shocks. And fuzzy dice. And aftermarket crappy starters and red distributor caps and red frame rails. And obnoxious racing seats. 
What else do we despise? And giant five inch tachometers and shift lights and chassis lights and wheel lights or underbody lights or chassis glow, all that stuff. And stamped crappy chrome valve covers or just anything chrome that's stamped and crappy. I feel like we're missing quite a few pickups that sit too high or just any vehicle with terrible stances and wheel and tire combination. People putting trailer wheels, crappy chrome trailer wheels on their cars, Crown Vic suspension or chassis swaps, Ugh. El Caminos after 1972. Putting that to say that I don't like El Caminos. 59, 60 El Caminos, and then what? They took a break from 61 to 63. So then yeah, 64 to 72 El Caminos are great. 73 on up. Leaves, leaves a lot to be desired in my opinion. A 73 to 77 would be moderately acceptable. And then, then they went to the G body. Just don't do it for me. Unless they had a manual transmission. If they got a clutch pedal, so then you could put like a six speed in it, would be pretty sweet. Or just steal the pedals and put them in a cutlass or some other Jeeva. Okay, Moroso aluminum valve covers ready to remove. You can have neoprene or cork valve cover gaskets. I'm saying cork. Sure stuck like cork. Oh yeah, that's cork with a lot of blue RTV. Woo! Roller tip rockers? Dang! I'm starting to get excited again. Just a little bit. Maybe they're a full roller rocker. Just the tip. Just the tip. So, I, I don't know a ton about anything, but they got a roller on the end, so that makes it a roller tip rocker. But I think there's a roller bearing in this pivot shaft here too, so they should be full roller rockers. I would, I would sure think so, anywho. Don't see a name on them, so that's not good. They are 441 heads, I have heard of those. They're not great, but they're not the worst. You got ARP head bolts. Everything looks clean like it's hardly got any miles on it, just like everything else, so no surprise there. Alright, now let's see if this thing comes off. For cheese and rice. Should be 12 volts holding the intake on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's some good silicone, boys. Ow! Goodness gracious. All of the RTV. Sure enough, no China wall gaskets, just a whole lot of blue RTV. Looks like they got some type of valley pan tray something thing. I've never seen in a small block underneath here. Well, I guess we'll pull some headers off. Get some heads off, then we'll probably pull this whatever splash shield here. Looks like 50031 is the part number on the push rods, so they're aftermarket push rods. Can we see? Yeah, they look just like hydraulic lifters. Just your run of the mill hydraulic lifters. No full roller. Thankfully, they only got a couple bolts holding the headers on, so that will be quick work removing them. Even quicker work when you use an electric impact. I'm guessing it's, oh. It's a foreign distributor. It says Power Master on it, but I'm guessing it's just a reconfigured Toyota or Honda or something. I know that's pretty common for me doing. I think they use like Ford Taurus ones or some damn thing. If you know what that Power Master alternator is, 
comment down below. Okay, let's pull some head bolts off. Looks like we're gonna have to take the rockers off in order to get at the bolts in between the rockers. The tip of said 50031 push rod isn't present. Both ends should look like that. It's just to keep on coming, kids. And that's what led me to it, was I could hear something fall when I took that rocker off. Sure enough, there's the ball off the end of that push rod. There it is right there. I think they just used some mild steel push rods and then the machine these and press them in. It was probably just fine until I took it apart. I mean, it was, it had already failed, but it was what it held together because it's always in compression and it's got a little machined lip there that it rides on when it's under compression, so it should have been fine. I don't know, maybe not. Moment of truth, see how bad she really is. Coolant? I suppose they didn't drain the block. Surprisingly, things look good. It's got Felpro gaskets. I don't know if they're different gaskets than standard small blocks, but they got that fancy blue stripe in there. You can see the piston's pretty banged up from whatever bouncing around in there, but the cylinder walls look pretty good. So if we could find another piston to replace that one, maybe have to figure out what caused it. Everything else looks Pretty good. I didn't see any issues with the push rods on the other side. The only thing, this piston back here is cleaner than the other ones. Like maybe there was some coolant getting in there. So I'm gonna look over the head gasket real good. Make sure there was nothing pushing through there. I don't see anything. So maybe we'll pull it apart. So we can get a part number off that piston. Throw everything back together. Find a push rod. Yeah, but. Still got to pull that engine out, figure out what that piston is, if we can get one, or if we got to buy eight new ones, or if we just slam a mystery one in there. What happens when you just take a standard compression piston or, or you mix and match pistons? I'm sure somebody on the YouTube world's done it. Comment down below. It probably runs just fine. All right. I'm going to take a break. It's uh, lunchtime. One more thing before we go to lunch. The heads look great. I believe these are... 202 160s. The reason you can tell is how close they are to touching one another. We'll have to look up that 441 casting code and let you know. But it seems like I remember them being a pretty decent number head for original heads. But yeah, I don't know how in the world that piston escaped without mashing up that valve because it would have had to go through the exhaust. But we can take a look at that. The other side looks just as good. Where the French did we set it? Over here. Yeah. This one's good. And then this is that cylinder that I said looked like it might have been getting some water in it. You can see the exhaust valve is significantly whiter than the other ones. Mojo's taking a snow day today, so we'll have to pick his brain when he comes in tomorrow to see what he thinks is going on in cylinder number seven. And there's a little bit of crap inside these heads. They didn't do a very great job of hot tanking them. It don't look like. Quick little Mortsky minute on cylinder heads, specifically small block Chevy cylinder heads. So 100 years ago, before the aftermarket got really big, there was 
your Vortex cylinder heads, there was your Camelback cylinder heads, and uh, the way to identify cylinder heads is by, there's a little marking on the front that you can use, otherwise you can use the casting number. I usually go by the casting number because it just seems easier to do a search on the internet and it seems to be uh, more exact per se. But there's a few things to look at at cylinder heads, whether they're prone to crack or not, there are some cylinder heads that are prone to cracking with heat, uh, mainly your smog era ones. Uh, the cylinder combustion chamber size. So these specific heads, the 441, are a 76 cc chamber. The larger the chamber, generally speaking, the lower the compression you were going to have. And with a blower motor, we want low compression because blower motor things. You don't want high compression because we're cramming that air in there with the blower. We don't need to do that via compression. Compression is a whole nother story. For example, the 283 that we have that we can't get to run because it has probably too high a compression. We're going to dive into that another day that has a 460 cylinder number heads and those are 68 cc so they're a lot smaller than the 76 cc that we had on there but you can get 64 cc heads and then uh there's the cc of the the runners i don't know that's something to do with with flow stuff like that and then there's your valve size so this particular set of 441s have is a 194 and a 150 valve so 1.94 inch intake valve and a 1.50 inch exhaust valve. Exhaust, you're pushing it out with the piston, so they're always smaller. Uh, intake, you're drawing it in. It's not being, you know, vacuum isn't as good as pressure, maybe per se. So they're they're always larger. Uh, and the way you can tell valve sizes, if they got big valves, if they're if they're almost touching, that means it's got big valves. So if this thing were to be 202s and 160s, they would be just about touching each other. There's a little itty bitty gap in between them right now. But of course now there's aftermarket cylinder heads, there's aluminum cylinder heads, there's uh straight spark plugs, there's angled spark plugs, there's all kinds of stuff. The angled spark plugs, I guess, supposed to get a the spark in a better spot in the cylinder stuff like that so all that information is out there on the internet uh, but those are some of the things to look for on cylinder heads and then if they've got uh, press in uh, rocker arm studs or if they've got threaded in uh, the press in ones of course can come out if you've got a high lift cam or a solid lifter cam stuff like that thread in ones are a lot better quality and then you get into rocker arms you got different ratios you got aluminum you got steel you got roller tip rockers you got full roller rockers you got all kinds of stuff to look at there so some of the things to look for is valve size uh, look at the numbers on them you got uh, cc of your combustion chamber aluminum versus cast iron there's all kinds of information out there but have your phone ready look at the number if you're looking at a set of heads at a swap meet or at a barn find or if you find a set on facebook marketplace check them out uh, another thing is get a magnaflex to see if they got cracks in them especially if it's a set that is prone to cracking and then uh, also on a small block chevy there's accessory bolt holes on the front which if you're going to run a long water pump without buying some aftermarket accessories if you want to use the stock ones you probably got to have the front accessory mounts and then of course that's going to vary if you're running an alternator on which side it's on and then if you're going to run air conditioning so you can get away with not having the holes drilled stuff like that but there's just so much information out there in cylinder heads i just wanted to give you a quick little rundown on some of the things to look for now back to your regularly scheduled shenanigans from hotel de la catalina wine mixer All right, got her pulled up. Let's drain the oil. See if there's anything crusty about that. I did drain the block. That didn't look real great. It was super black and crusty on this side. But All right, let's check the oil. They probably changed it right before they put it in here. So who knows? We'll see. Super sweet chrome oil pan that's guaranteed to leak. Oh yeah. Looks like brand new 15 year old oil. Let's spin this craptastic 
Fram oil filter off over at it. Oh, man, look at what he told me it was missing the pan. Son of a biscuit. Leave that drain for a bit before we pull the pan off to try to save ourselves more of a mess. Spill a little ATF, pulling her out. Per usual. Yeah, I think we gotta grab the boost gauge and maybe a couple other small items. And this thing can go away. I'm not sure if I told you, but the gentleman who bought that 48 Chevrolet Coupe, really nice car that I got original at a auction in South Dakota, Central South Dakota, Central Southern South Dakota, down by the Nebraska border. He bought it, he's uh, about two hours away. And anyway, he was looking to street rod that thing. So I said, hey, I got a deal for you. Got this thing in here. So he's gonna come pick this up and use the chassis and maybe the seats, wheels, tires, whatever else. But so he's kind of getting the rolling chassis out of this deal. And we'll get a few bucks back out of this deal, but we paid a pretty good chunk of change for this thing. So yeah, but anyway, we'll free up a stall and uh, hopefully get his project going. So that's where that's going. All right, we'll let that drain a while and then we'll uh, roll it over and rip it apart. We should probably Get the lifters out of there and get them all marked in which location they go before we tip it upside down and they fall out. Cause that would be no bueno. The good news is all the cam lobes push the lifters up. I didn't look at all of them, but the ones I did look at look like they probably got any miles on them. Did slice my finger open pretty good on the head gasket. Even though they're not the old copper and steel ones. They're pretty sharp. Maybe it was the quarter of the block. I'll say it was a quarter of the block, because I'm a tough guy. It takes steel to cut me. Ouch. Dipstick too, break to my dipstick. A little black sludginess going on in there, but the oil that came out looked good. Let's see what the bottom end looks like here. Oh, it's got a made in USA oil pump. I'm guessing those rods are either new or reconditioned. It's a four bolt main. Yeah. Well, I guess let's pop our piston out go from there i don't see anything bad news bears under here we might be all right the crank even looks new all right we're gonna take these two three ace nuts off push that piston out and i'll take a look at it you gonna do it you gonna help no okay Pretty good scratch in that bearing, unfortunately. And these aren't marked, so I'm gonna have to mark them quick. Now we don't want our rod bolts scuffing up our crank journals, so tech tip of the day, you can buy these fancy slip-on sleeves and pay real money or just get a chunk of 3 ace fuel hose. Slide that over there. That way, we can't scar up our crankshaft. All right, so it'll just push out of there. Not a chance. Good news is I can't feel a scar on the crankshaft. I try to find a part number on this thing. Oh, so it looks like there's three rings here. I don't know the names of them. I think this is your oil ring. Here's your top ring and your middle ring. And we are missing a big chunk of the ring. About a third of it's gone right there, so hopefully that went out the exhaust. And it's stuck as well. Alright, see what we can come up with. These pistons seem 
really, really short deck height. What if this isn't like a 383 stroker? I don't know. Anywho, we gotta find a part number. KB. We'll do some research on the interwebs. And it looks like they're stamped. I don't know if I can show you that. 30 it says in there, so I assume they're a 30 over piston. All right, did a little digging. KB, I'm sure you guessed it. Keith Black. She's a Keith Black Pistons. He's a pretty well-known in the industry. And it's a 118 is the style. That's the low compression. It's got the 22cc chamber. It's hyper eutectic. It's for a 5.7 inch rod and 1.56 inch compression height. So that's the top of the piston to the center of the wrist pin. And what else was there, Duff? Oh, it's uh, 30 over. So it's a part number KB 118 dash. Never mind the bobblehead. Those aren't, those aren't available for purchase yet. So it's a Keith Black model 118 and it's 30 over. As you guys saw in there. So yeah, looks like we can get a new set for, I don't know, 450, 500 bucks, probably shipped and then another 50 for rings. So hopefully under 600 bucks, the push rod is a Melling brand. Uh, I can get four of those on the old uh, eBay for like 20 bucks, pretty cheap. So with the gasket set, hopefully we're in under a thousand bucks, get this thing up and going. We're gonna take and inspect all the uh, rods and mains. Uh, I did pop the bearing on that. They're Clevite, they're dated June of 99. So roughly a 24 year old, 25 year old engine build, about what we were thinking. They're Clevite bearings. So we're gonna check all the bearings, make sure they look good. Maybe throw a new set of bearings in there if we see anything. If not, we might run them. Those don't look that bad, but I think we're going to order a set anyway. But we got to figure it out if the mains are 10 under. And uh, yeah. So I'm going to do some digging, see if we can get some pistons ordered up, see if they're available. Uh, there's a lot of different brands and uh, models available, but I think scenes how this is what they built it with. And they're a low compression piston with that dish there, that 22cc dish. I think that's what we want to stick with, even though it failed, but that's what we're going to stick with. And then we'll just have to press the wrist pin out of the rod and then press it back into the uh, new piston and rod and slam it back together. And then we'll have seven spare pistons and rings. Right, Duff? What are we going to do with one of those? Build a blown V6? Yeah, right. All right, I'm going to go order some parts and so we're going to inspect some bearings. Go from there. Somebody got a new dog bed and they're actually using it. Such a good boy. So we got all our rod caps marked. And Mojo noticed this. Where's it at? Anyway, we're missing a tooth on the ring gear. Take my word for it. So we're gonna have to get one of those. Maybe that happened when the explosion happened, but also that's the bypass. So when your filter plugs, Oil can continue to flow, it just bypasses the filter. They got that plug. So if the filter were ever to plug, it would either starve the engine of oil or blow the filter off, probably blow the filter off. So comment down below if you've ever seen that and know why somebody would do that. Never seen that before. Like I said, I can't see that ending well. All right, add another, uh, flex plates are pretty cheap. 50 bucks to the tab. What brand is this one? Specification. I don't know. I can't read it. Either way, that tooth is no bueno. And then it kind of chipped a chunk off the one next to it. So we'll just throw that one away. All right, got her all bundled up. Snuggest a bug in a rug. Never mind the little drippy drips down there. Seems like they do that forever. Went on Rock Auto, got a one piece oil pan gasket, got a valve cover gaskets, got rubber, cause I like the rubber ones. I don't know why, Cork, cork's fine. Uh, new intake gaskets, I like Felpro gaskets. So we got uh, the same Felpro head gasket, uh, intake gasket. What else did we get? Oh, we got a new set of Keith Black 118, KB 118-030 pistons. We're only gonna put one in there. We're gonna have to figure out a way to press that piston onto the rod, get a wrist pin out. I think I got an idea, otherwise we're gonna have to go to a machine shop. We got 
seven extras to screw up on. I got four of the Melling push rods. I forget the part number. They were like 20 bucks eBay. We're gonna take the heads apart. We're gonna check the valves, uh, check the springs, check all that stuff, check the valve seats out. And uh, hopefully less than a thousand bucks into this thing, we'll be putting this thing back together. So here's a story on this deal. This thing was on Facebook Marketplace for $10,000. I know people generally shoot for the low end, but $10,000 for a rolling hot rod that's painted with interior and a blower motor is pretty freaking cheap. I think that's, there's a blower motor right now, a 355, so basically the same thing on Marketplace right now for $9,500. Sitting on a stand, like never been fired. So you could be dealing with the same thing as this is. So. I got three grand back out of the body and chassis. So I'm into this thing for about seven, another grand to get it going. So if this works, I'm into a blower motor for eight grand. I think that's a pretty good deal, an okay deal. At least I know what I got now, kind of, maybe. But anyway, I rolled the dice and this is what we got. We got ourselves a catastrophe. So a couple things that I could tell you, if you're going to look at a motor like this or any type of engine, that's used, take a spark plug socket with, pull the plugs out, look at them. Get, one of, get, get a depth stick or a, uh, what do we call those things? Anyway, get a camera and sneak in there. You can get them on Amazon for under 50 bucks or get a hold of your buddy who's got one, borrow theirs. Go check it out. Look inside the cylinders, check the numbers on it to see if it's an actual three, I mean, if you're buying just a stock, Carbureted engine, you know, check to make sure it's a 350 or a 400 or 302, 383, 440, whatever it is. Make sure the numbers are there. And then take some tools, take the valve cover off, see what kind of valve train's in there, and run the numbers on the head so you know what size valves and CC chambers and all that stuff is. So I could have saved myself a big headache if I'd have taken spark plug socket and a camera with. I'd have seen that piston, I'd have seen that spark plug was bent up on the electrode. And I just said, you know, I wouldn't have passed. I would have negotiated. And then he probably wouldn't have negotiated. And then I uh, would have been right back where I was. But anyway, I'd have probably paid full retail because I'm an idiot. So learn from my lessons. Uh, buyer beware. Do as much research as you can. Run the numbers on the carburetor. You know, go there, get all the numbers. Go sit at Perkins or Hardee's or Arby's or in a parking lot of a Starbucks. Don't go in there and buy their silly coffee. That's for, for the Oklahoma guy. That weirdo spends $40 a day on coffee. Go sit somewhere, do some research on your phone, figure out what the numbers are. Better yet, message the person and get the numbers ahead of time. So uh, another thing, do I think this guy screwed me over? No, I don't think he was aware of this. Just the way that this engine was set back into that car Everything was getting hooked up. He hadn't fired it up in that car. I don't think if he'd have known that that motor was wounded, he would have put it in that car. At least I certainly hope not. But it is what it is, buyer beware. I'm not blaming it on Mark who sold me this thing. I should have done my research. And like I said, I, I don't think that he knew. I, like, I certainly hope not because well, I'm a firm believer in karma. So if somebody did that to me, bad things are gonna happen to them. But. I'm not gonna do any bad things. They just, just the karma, the karma world coming around. So there you have it. Hopefully we'll get this thing back together. We'll have Mojo check it out and we'll put new rings and bearings in it. Well, we'll just put a ring and a piston in it and uh, put some new bearings in it, new gaskets, button it up, clean it up. And this thing we can throw in the run stand, fire it up. And uh, we'll know what we got. Hopefully we get some nice blower surge and it'll be real fun. And, who knows, maybe we'll get crazy and put it on a dyno like uh, Moneybags DD Speed Shop up there in Kanukistan. All right, there you have it. Thank you very much for watching. Go check out our merch, mortski.com. I need you guys to buy a whole bunch of merch so that I can financially recover from this because I don't know that there's a way that we're ever gonna financially recover. I am never gonna financially recover from this. But anyway, mortski.com, we got ball caps, we got beanies, we got sweatshirts, we got banners, we got screwdrivers, we got can openers, bottle openers, church keys, they're on there, they're new. I was supposed to mention it in this video, but 
Maybe we'll sneak it in there. Maybe you didn't see it. Maybe I forgot. Who knows? We got church keys, bottle openers. They're cool. Uh, magnetic screwdrivers. We got a couple of the SS5 scrapers left. Get them while they're hot. Remember, it doesn't matter how you get it done, as long as you're having fun. Blown blower motors are not fun, are they, Duff? Oh yeah, don't forget to comment down below what you think we should do with this blower motor. Should we put it in a 75 Chevrolet Rusty Blazer? Should we put it in Reggie? Should we build a completely different hot rod? Should we put it in uh, Casper? Is that what we're calling it? The short box square body? Put it in Rex, 66 Chevy long box? What do you think we should put a blown small block in in the yard? Ooh, now we're talking. That ain't a bad idea. Maybe a 56 gasser with a four speed duff? Now we're talking. Comment down below. Also, do you think I got screwed? Do you think he knew about it? Or was it just bad luck? If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. All right, on to the next one.